attending. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join this webinar. For those of you who are not familiar with SPDC, we're going to give you a little bit of education as what we do. As Carolyn introduced myself, my name is Brent Hoover. I run the Aiken area SPDC here. I'm also a professor at USC Aiken for the School of Business. In addition to myself is Jason Rabin. He's with First Citizens Bank. Now, you know the name says cash flow and credit. We're actually going to flip these up in reverse order. Jason has a very important meeting after this, so I told him he can go first. And therefore, we'll give an initial introduction into SPDC services. And then we will begin forward on to the credit analysis. So as you can see, here's our review for today. And because Jason is leaving early, if you have any questions for him, please email him directly. He's also going to provide his phone number. Or you can leave those questions in the chat at the end. And I'll be sure to get those to Jason. So with that started, let's actually go on to our first real slide. The SBDC, who are we? Well, number one, our acronym stands for the South Carolina Small Business Development Center. Okay, We have been here for quite a bit of a while. You will find SBDC offices all around the state of South Carolina. What do we do? We assist for-profit businesses. This could be things such as preparing a bank loan package, putting a business plan together, looking at cash flow analysis, hence the topic of our today's discussion, prepping for government contracting, working on basic cyber hygiene, you name it, we can offer these scenarios. The only things we can't do, we cannot offer tax advice and I cannot give legal advice. However, we can get you connected with those professionals. Now, the cool feature about this is because we're funded through the Small Business Administration, the SBA, we actually can allow it to be services at no cost to you as the client. And yes, everything that is said is confidential. We're bound by confidentiality statements. We have to sign a new one each year. So we take that quite seriously. Now, if you see the second point, access to valuable resources. So some of those resources will actually include a document we're going to look at today. I mean, we'll put together templates for not only business plans, startup checklists, but in this case, pro forma templates that you can use for a bank loan, or if you just want to evaluate what's going on with your financial data. Obviously, this next point, you're already here. You're at a training workshop. Due to COVID, we are working on this webinar schedule. We're looking at the potential option of doing hybrid scenarios for the future. Regardless, though, we're here to educate the public. And we'd be happy if we can convert some of you to clients. And for those existing clients who are already on the call, welcome. We greatly appreciate you continuing to take advantage of the value that we offer. Now, you may have heard me mention cybersecurity earlier. So this is a new initiative that we started, I think, right around the COVID period, Okay, which is kind of ironic considering that we went virtual. Things have become quite dangerous from a cyber standpoint. We're trying to make sure that clients are well protecting their IP. You spent so much time putting this intellectual property together. We're hoping that you'll actually take the initiative to use some of our services. The CMMC level one debut model is dropping and we want to make clients aware of that. It doesn't require a cyber degree. A lot of it's pretty self-explanatory and just showcasing that you are protecting not only your individual assets, but potentially the assets, say if you're a government contractor, of those perhaps of the Department of Defense. So that's a brief overview into what we offer. Yes, it goes more detailed, but we're trying to essentially capture the highlights for you today. Now, with that said, I told you we're going a little out of order. Um, I had no problem with it all. Jason is going to start us off on the credit angle. Jason, please take it away. All right. Uh, Brent, can you hear me? I can indeed. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, having us and uh, thank you for adjusting the, the schedule for this. I, I did have a, a meeting get rescheduled and it is something that we've been working on here at the bank uh, for some time. And so I greatly appreciate your uh, convenience and moving your schedule around and allowing us to go first. And again, as Brent said, I'll be happy to address any questions that you may have. I actually do have an associate here with me, uh, Ben Reeves, who uh, manages our, our downtown office and it's a uh, highly experienced banker who's been in both the credit world and the management role uh, for us. And so um, if there's anything that uh, needs to be addressed in the uh, immediate fashion, uh, Ben can certainly stay on um, as I exit uh, at the end of the presentation. But again, my contact information will be provided and uh, look forward to potentially helping or assisting you with uh, both your credit needs and from your uh, lending standpoint. So 
Um, with that, I'll get uh, started in a brief introduction of what First Citizens Bank has been doing over the last few years um, and all the way back into 1898 uh, when we, we started in a, as a bank in uh, Smithfield, North Carolina. We initially started as a agricultural uh, bank. Uh, we were in the tobacco farming um, out of Smithville um, and the holding family launched uh, First Citizens Bank. Um, so 100 plus years later, uh, we have grown to the largest family controlled bank in the country. Um, we have uh, over 500 branches in 19 states, um, primarily in the south and southeast corridors. And then we um, stretch all the way out to the west coast and uh, California and Oregon and Washington. Um, but we are primarily a um, community bank uh, based um, and ran organization. However, we have all the big boy bank uh, products and, and love to, to be able to uh, provide avenues in that uh, situation. So um, we are going through a acquisition currently, which will make us the um, 18th largest bank in the country. We'll become over $100 billion in assets. Um, and we will have even more robust products than we currently do today. Um, so with that, um, we help not only the small business, which in, in it, if you've known me for some time, if you haven't, um, I truly believe and uh, have always believed that small business is the backbone to our economy. Uh, without small businesses um, providing services and, and so forth, whether it be on the retail sector or just providing jobs in our communities, um, it's, a, it's a vital part to making our world go round and round. So, um, thank you for you guys being involved in both SPDC and, and owning and operating a business now or whether it's in the future. So with that, that's a little bit about First Citizens Bank. Be happy to address any of those questions. But our motto is people first, community first and forever first. So we like being first. We don't like losing. Uh, but if we can't get something done for you, we're going to put you in a, in a path to succeed um, and get there. So um, if I can help in any way, look forward to doing that and uh, being a part of it. So. So how do you get there? Um, and I think that's understanding your credit um, and what is your credit report. Um, you may not be aware that you have credit, um, a credit score, both on your personal uh, background, but also your, your business uh, as well. So really a credit report is a summary of how you've handled your credit accounts. Um, they're usually used by potential lenders and creditors to help them just determine uh, whether or not uh, they offer you credit. And then if so, at what terms. And so the higher your credit score, obviously, um, the better your chances are of obtaining credit, but also the fact that uh, those terms are going to be in more favor to you uh, versus uh, the latter. It's uh, obviously in this day and age uh, in our world with hacks and, and scams going on, it's it vital. And if they take nothing away from today, it's imperative that you that you monitor your accounts um, and monitor your credit reports on a regular basis. And so there are three major, major credit bureaus to check into. Um, and 99.9% .9 of all banks and financial institutions use um, either uh, one, two, or three of these. It just depends on what financial institution you're working with, which one they're using, or a blended score of all three. Um, and those are Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Um, and so, it, they, the reporting is done uh, pretty much to all three, but some um, obviously are not reported against others, but um, it, it's vital to check all three because you just never know who you need to see and make sure that those reports are accurate and up to date. And so um, we uh, here at the bank, we use Equifax and Experian. Um, our mortgage department uses all three. So really it just boils down to the fact that, uh, of checking all three on a regular basis. So. That's it with that slide, Brent, if you can go to the next one, I'll, I'll keep moving on. So what makes up your credit score? Um, the biggest factor in that is, is your payment history. Uh, making payments on time is critical uh, to maintaining a good credit score. Uh, so if you make late payments or you're uh, behind schedule on some of those payments, that is negatively impacting your credit score and it's the quickest way to have a, a credit score uh, go down. Um, the second factor in your credit score is the amount owed. 
Um, and so whether or not you utilize your credit limits on your revolving lines of credit, and that being credit cards or lines of credits or your home equity line of credit, those are all potential debt sources. And so if you have a $100,000 home equity line, but you have a zero balance on that, well, you still have a potential to go into debt of $100,000. And so the bank used that to report uh, to the credit bureaus as potential debt. Um, whether or not you've paid on time or not it is a positive, but you do have that ability to obtain debt. And so that is a factor in, in turning your credit score. So what I would say to that is that you don't want to have a, a substantial amount of uh, credit cards to, to save 5% when you're checking out at the, at the retail store down the street, um, nor do you want to have um, uh, uh, five or six different lines of credit uh, attached to your checking accounts. Have one or two here and there, um, so that you have some credit history. And so that's kind of uh, you, your next uh, factor in your credit score is new accounts. So obtaining new accounts when you're checking out at Old Navy or checking out at Bed Bath & Beyond or checking out at uh, your retail uh, store of your choice, uh, just to obtain 5% discount on your uh, purchases that day is not necessarily the best thing to do. Um, obviously, you, you probably haven't checked into the fact that their interest rate may be 19.99%, um, but the factor that uh, you've also now obtained a new credit um, reporting uh, company, so that you're negatively impacting your credit score in that regard. Um, the other factor of that is that you've had potential uh, credit being reported uh, or debt being reported from a financial institution or um, a credit card company that you've had. And so that length of history is, is a key thing. Um, you know, obviously, if you're to start closing out accounts, you really want to make sure that you're paying attention to which credit uh, has been established the longest, um, and because those are factors in being able to report um, that you've been able to repay those debts over a period of time. Um, and the longer that period of time is, the better off you, uh, your credit score is going to be impacted. And then the last thing being on that is the types of credit and whether it being your mortgages, your student loans, your credit cards, um, et cetera. Those are all things that are um, looking uh, at from a, a stance of how many types of credit you had and the variety of being um, a, a positive. So. That was what makes up your credit score. So we'll kind of go into the next slide and, and really look to see what's considered good credit. So um, if you've had 850 credit score, um, you're in the top 1% of any client that I've really ever seen. Um, I've only, and I've been in banking for 15 years now and have looked at credit reports the entire time. Um, I've seen one in my 15 years of banking that's uh, had 850, let alone 845 or higher. Um, and so it's um, if you've got an 850 credit score, that is a phenomenal feat that uh, uh, pat yourself on the back. Maybe even uh, come see me for your next loan. We'll, we'll make sure we get it done for you. Um, but some items that can affect your score. So you have some inquiries, whether or not you're, you're going out there and trying to obtain credit. Um, late payments, collection payments, and bankruptcies all can be on there um, from two years up to 10 years. And so um, those are things that are going to affect you. Um, and so making sure that you're staying ahead of that um, is, is vital to maintaining a good credit score. The banking uh, in today's world, anything really above a 700 is considered good. Um, and and I think the next slide will kind of go through that. And so uh, Bert, if you may want to move into the next slide here. Um, yeah, so there are credit score ranges. So obviously 300 is kind of your minimum, 850 being your maximum, but where it's kind of the where you need to be at to obtain credit from a financial institution to, to go launch a new business. Um, and I had to really say that anything above 640 is something that we here at First Citizens Bank uh, will consider. But really getting to that 670, 680 range is kind of vital to being able to obtain multiple different financial institutions and uh, them, their assistance on attaining new credits. And so um, the credit score is above average if you're at 740, um, and that just goes uh, across the U.S., 
uh, from a consumer standpoint and basically demonstrates to a variety of different lenders that you're able to uh, obtain credit and also repay that credit. So anything above 800 is considered exceptional. And I'd say you're in the top 15 to 20 percent of, uh, uh, of all consumers once you get to above 800. So look for your credit score to be above 640, really get to 680, um, and then you can really be able to obtain credit from most financial institutions across uh, this region in particular. So um, if you move into the next slide, Brent, we'll go on to um, our business credit score. And so just like you uh, have uh, on your personal side, you have a credit score on your business side. And, and most people may not be aware of that. It's not uh, unusual. Um, I've had many of uh, uh, business owners come to me um, who've been in business for, for many number of years, but didn't realize that their business actually has a credit score. Um, and that credit score is a little bit different than your personal, but the same factors really apply. Um, the credit score range on a business is zero to 100. Again, going back to the retail consumer side, that's 300 to 850. So your business credit score has got a much smaller range, um, and that's zero to 100. Uh, zero being the higher risk and 100 obviously being uh, the lower list for the render, lender stance uh, on that. And so if you have a, a 80 or 85, that's considered great. Uh, if you have a hundred, that may be that, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a hundred to be honest with you. I'm not, not hundred percent positive. These are somewhat new to the banking world, but, um, some items that are considered when calculating a credit score on a business is obviously, uh, your obligation to pay back, um, both your suppliers and your lenders, um, your legal filings on a UCC, uh, at a local and county and state court, uh, records, um, company background uh, information from public records and credit card companies and collections agencies um, and those types of things are, are going to be filed and, and obviously company backgrounds are, are done on a regular basis. Your trade payment experiences um, submitted by your payees and so whether or not you're providing uh, goods and services um, in a timely manner can be uh, a positive in, in boosting your credit score or a negative in, in vice versa situation if you're not paying uh, and so forth on a timely basis. Any other public records uh, obtained um, in your local county and state uh, court systems, um, any collections that are being filed, and then obviously um, a background on the company and comparative data for other industries and then like uh, businesses across the country and region. So um, done in Bradstreet is kind of your main big one. Um, if you think about your, your reporting agencies and who kind of compiles all this information for financial institutions or lenders, um, those are a big uh, component of, of who we go to to obtain that information uh, in a quick manner. So, Brett, if you go to the next slide. Um, again, there's a, a number of factors that are affecting your business credit score. As I've mentioned, um, there are over 140 reporting variables in that case. Um, and so in a number of those factors can cause a shift in the score. Um, but obviously we talked about most of these, but, um, derogatory public records, your, uh, trend and payment obligations and uh, your increase in the number of business credit inquiries. Um, and then obviously your your SIC code or your NAICSIC code from a um, standard industrial classification um, and the size of business and demographic data that's being reported. So all the information that's being uh, reported in various number of sources are all being used to calculate your business credit score. Now, I will say that from a banking institution uh, standpoint, that, that is a your business credit score is a factor. It is a, it's an important factor whether or not we're going to stint, uh, lend uh, you any uh, money uh, or to allow you to obtain credit. Uh, but it is a factor um, to some degree in making sure that we are doing our due diligence on the front end to make sure that uh, you've paid your previous uh, uh, things back and there are no negative uh, consequences to come. So. That is a uh, number of different factors. I won't beat this horse um, too much, but um, we can kind of uh, talk about that off record if needed. And so a lot of questions on, on this have come in previous um, presentations. And so how long does that data stay on a business credit report? Well, there's really no justification in that. Um, it, the typical data staying on there for the minimum of three years, really I've seen some data stay on there for, for 10 plus years. And it really just uh, 
is determined by how quickly that individual or business is, is trying to remove some of that data, whether or not they've uh, made clear of some obligations that may have been recorded um, and so forth. And so really, if it, you got to make sure that you're being uh, cognizant of that and uh, taking care of those credits that are uh, potentially going into collections as quickly as possible. Um, because they are going to stay on there for a mat minimum uh, 36 months and, and up, upwards of 10 years. But uh, the trade data, the bankruptcies, your uh, your judgments and tax liens, uh, you can kind of see on the slide that uh, there's a number of different things that are going to be uh, reporting on your credit report on the business standpoint. And so um, making sure that it's accurate and that it's uh, maintained on a regular basis is, is vital as well. Just as you check your personal credit, uh, you need to to check your business credit report as well. Um, so we'll go into the next slide. Um, so obviously there are a lot of companies that are small and uh, single sole proprietors uh, that are starting out. They don't have um, a business credit report or they may not even have a, a business name yet and are filing um, to even start that process. So business owners will obviously use their personal credit in order to run their business. It's not uncommon. Um, I would just say be cautious of doing such uh, because the worst thing you can have done is, is your business go into bankruptcy and you've got everything in your personal name. And now you've also uh, potentially put at risk your other assets that uh, maybe your home and uh, your car and so forth. And so don't, don't put you or your family into potential uh, liabilities when it comes to that. But um, talk to your tax advisor, talk to your legal uh, rep representative on making sure that you're doing things the correct way as it comes to separating both the business and your personal assets and, and making sure that you're setting up that in the correct order. Uh, but really, it's it, banks are moving away from just relying on the personal credit score of the bar, but we're, we're judging the business financial health as being our main uh, primary source of repayment. Um, the secondary or, or tertiary uh, repayment source really needs to come from the guarantor or the uh, individual um, on that stance. And so uh, let's make sure the business looks good first, and then we'll worry about our secondary and third source of sources of repayment. Um, and so making sure that you're not closely linking those two is going to be critical to obtaining credit for most financial institutions, especially moving forward, but in most cases in today's, uh, in today's credit uh, culture. So obviously we're, we're kind of seeming to go back into uh, a pandemic and, and COVID coming back in the Delta variant. We won't go into political or uh, vaccine um, discussions. However, obviously our COVID-19 has been a, um, an impact uh, on the, both the financial and institutional standpoint, but also it, more importantly, uh, most of our businesses obviously have seen a, a negative impact in some way, shape or form. And really, um, I think a lot of things uh, have come out of this and whether or not individuals or businesses were able to pivot um, have made them uh, keep their doors open. Um, I think uh, most small businesses would tell you that the last 12 to 18 months have been um, uh, an 18 months that they would not want to relive um, of maintaining their current employees, uh, at trades, et cetera, um, and keeping their business sustainable. And so I commend all of you who are in that world. Um, I know it's not been easy. Uh, but I think uh, bright, brighter days are ahead, um, and uh, I commend you on keeping the best foot forward. And if there's anything a financial institution can do to help you, it's only um, uh, just please reach out. I think it's uh, it's key to recognize that a lot of small businesses have suffered, um, but uh, we're here to help you. And, and one way to really making sure that's done is uh, make your payments as on time as as often as you can. Um, and making sure that you're monitoring your credit report. Um, it is key right now. And, and with uh, you, you may be in a tight spot from a cash flow standpoint, um, but it, making sure that you're paying those bills on time is going to be key to obtaining credit down the road. And so uh, just get through the next few months. Hopefully we, we come out of this uh, all better, uh, but uh, it is one way to uh, quickly make your, your life better uh, in the future is maintain your credit 
maintaining your business credit and, and paying uh, back your um, your debts on time. And so there's one way to um, check those uh, credit reports and annualcreditreport.com is offering free weekly credit reports now through April of 2022. So I would encourage each and every one of you to, to do that as a banker, as a financial uh, lender, um, is something that I do on a regular basis. I have the, uh, the benefits of looking at bank accounts on a, on a, as soon as I touch my computer every morning, but uh, I would encourage you to check your bank accounts, check your credit scores and go into any credit report and, and checking your uh, credit reports on a weekly basis, at least uh, through April, 2022, because it's free. Um, and that's uh, a, a good resource to be able to utilize. So um, maybe it, no, I'm not sure. Yep. So that is uh, the quick overview of, of credit and uh, understanding your credit, uh, both on the personal side and the business side. Again, that's my contact information. Uh, ben Reeves is here with me as well in the room. Um, he'll be happy to address any questions. I got a few minutes, so I'll stick around as well. Um, so, but we'll turn it over to you, Brent. Um, again, appreciate you and SPDC and all that you guys do, uh, not only here in our, our local community of Aiken, but uh, across the state. Um, I know you guys do a, a tremendous job, and I would encourage anyone that's considering going to visit Brent. Um, I would highly recommend him uh, as well because he understands the, both the business side, but he also starts, understands what the bank looks for to uh, assist the. Uh, our mutual clients at that point. So uh, Brent, thanks again for all you do. And uh, again, look forward to helping anyone who may be online or um, that you run across here in the near future. So thanks. Thank you so um, much, Jason. We Brent, really appreciate it. before you get started, um, yes. there are still people that have not um, typed their name in the chat box. And there are two people specifically I'm unable to confirm registration. So I'm unable to confirm attendance. And that is um, Alita Tate and Sydney Mills. So by chance, if you're attending on someone else's behalf or you're using someone else's computer, please type your name in the chat box so I confirm your attendance. If you're representing a company that registered, please type that person's name and the company name in the chat box so I can confirm those. And my apologies, but please, Brent, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. No worries, Carolyn. So let's talk about the cash flow. So you heard Jason talk about not only the personal and the business credit, and that is gonna be interwoven into the, the topic that I am discussing today. Now, I do wanna put out two disclaimers before we get going. Number one, you may have heard the expression, I have a lot of assets, right? But someone may claim that they're actually quote unquote cash broke. That is easily possible. So here's why my first point is assets does not always necessarily equal the cash flow. When you look on a balance sheet, right? And you're going through your generally accepted accounting principles. There's a reason cash and cash equivalent is the most liquid and starts off as the first and foremost asset. However, not every asset is easily liquidated. It takes time. You can talk to some of the bankers here. They'll tell you they have to seize an asset. It takes a while and they'll lose some money out of that. Therefore, cash, and I cannot stress that enough, is the king. Now, when we're going to approach this from two different perspectives, because I know I've got multiple individuals on this line, we're going to approach it from the pre-venture side and from the existing business side. So I tried to have a good mix between the two. That way, everybody has something that they can take away from the value. There used to be this old song, the end is the beginning, is, begin is the end. I like that portion of the quote, because a lot of what you need to have in order to be effective with your cash flow analysis is the end goal in mind. There's some cool features in Excel that can definitely help about that. Also, too, I'm going to touch on some features in QuickBooks. I don't know if everybody is using that program, but if you are, there's some fun features within said program that can also assist you when we're looking at from the existing cash flow. Now, let's start once again with the basics, right? We heard Jason talk about the credit. You know, he mentioned, hey, the 670, 680, the reason he brought up 680 is that is the place to be is the minimum threshold for most SBA loans. Some of the SBA loans, such as the micro loan, are willing to go down to about 640. And of course, the score is not the end all be all. And lenders can tell you that they're looking at the context as well. But it's a great benchmark to be at. Now, he also mentioned business credit. That's where you see on the one is Paydex score. He talked about Dun & Bradstreet. Paydex is affiliated with the Dun and Bradstreet. That's their business credit score. You mentioned zero to 100. You want to be 80 or above. If you're in the 79 and I think it goes down to 60, you're a question mark. And you have 59 to zero. That's not going to reflect greatly when it comes time to needing financing. 
And why are we talking about financing here? Because that could be an option in order to boost your cash flow. Of course, you may need it when you're a startup business, but realize the COVID impact that Jason talked about. When COVID first hit and the lockdowns were initiated, we had people scrambling in order to maintain their cash flow at a standard rate. If you apply for PPP EIDL, you know that was not necessarily a breeze in terms of the timeline. It wasn't overnight you were receiving funds. Therefore, one of the tactics you may need perhaps would be a line of credit. You already had one available. Great, if you needed to get an emergency one, then we're gonna to start to look at some of these factors. And that applies moving forward if that's a tactic that you wanna use for a working capital buffer. So what do we end up suggesting? Well, I have 12 to 36 months. That is optimal. Sometimes it's not necessarily feasible. And when I mean cash reserves, I'm not just talking about business expenses. As Jason mentioned, a lot of businesses are sole proprietors. The mix of personal and business, it's all there together as one gel. Have you actually thought about your own health insurance? That's one of the first questions I ask somebody who comes through if they're starting a business. Well, how are you going to cover yourself? You know, there's plenty of personal expenses that you need to take into account. That's going to be particularly important when we want to analyze owner's withdrawal payments and use data modeling to see the impact on cash flow and is needed. So I want to reiterate that year to three years, we'll see some large companies, they won't go into business without three years worth of cash reserves. You're like, well, that, that's a lot of money. Yeah. But on the flip side, it will have you better prepared. And of course, you know, if we're going to be talking about any form of financing through a bank in the future, having collateral is definitely key. Yes, some banks are willing to do unsecured lines of credit or a small unsecured loan. However, you may not like the interest rate attached to that. It's good to keep a running list, a schedule of assets that could be pledged as collateral. What's the discount rate, et cetera. Similar to how you go in QuickBooks, right? You have a valuation of your inventory. You're able to see what's going on with that. It's a good idea. Okay, these are just prerequisites that I always want to throw out there. And they are interwoven into what Jason was talking about. Now, of course, if you are needing some form of financing, right? You know, you will end up with a loan package. But the first and foremost thing that is ever to be stressed is the pro forma. And I don't care if you're an existing business or you're a startup. Startup definitely needs that because they got to do the projections three years, maybe more. The break even is higher. But an existing business had, may actually use this as well. Think about it. What if you actually want to expand into a new location? Or this is a common thing that actually we end up working with cash flow on existing businesses. They're renting a location. They say, I look at my rent payment versus what I could be paying back to the bank monthly. It would actually save on the bottom line. Why don't I actually go buy the building that I'm renting from the current landlord? In that case, we still got to build a pro forma. It's just a lot easier because you actually have empirical evidence we can pull from QuickBooks, et cetera. But I want to stress that it's the foundation, not only of a business plan, but also too, in this case, when we're analyzing cash flow. All right. So let's say we do have to build out a pro forma, looking at our cash flow forecast. That's just a fancy term for essentially looking at the cash flow several years out. Now, I'm not here to talk about loan packages, right? That's not really the discussion, but I'm showing you some of the tools that might not be necessary for it if this is a form of financing that ties into your cash flow. Well, number one, as I mentioned, a lot of times it's three years of break even. You know, some loans go a little less. That's irrelevant for the discussion right now. One thing I'm seeing from a lot of lenders is this, the second point, working capital buffer. WC stands for working capital. Now, in this case, how do we define that? Well, what I typically like to do is take the operating expenses for one month, see if it's the average, I times it by six, and that'll be a six month working capital buffer. A bank may look at you and say, hey, we're gonna give you this money, but do you have this buffer, right? So maybe if your monthly expenses are $1,000 on average, that's $6,000. Do you have that sitting around in cash reserves? That's really critical. And it doesn't even matter if you're going to get a loan or you're a startup, irrelevant. That having that buffer in place is key because we've talked about, hey, can you get it to a year? That'd be great to cover personal and business. But on the flip side, a lot of the documents that I'm preparing right now, whether that be for a bank loan or simply doing cash flow analysis for a sole proprietor, I want to see what is that working capital buffer there. And to give you an FYI, some of the things we're discussing here, at the end, I'm actually going to pull up the Excel file I created as a pro forma template, and I can show you how we can use that sometimes either for that, you know, needing financing or just a existing business that wants to do some data modeling and determine what needs to be adjusted 
in order to make us more profitable. Now, you see there's two ratios. The debt service coverage ratio is only gonna apply if you actually have debt in that case, hence being the first word in said ratio. Now, how do we define this ratio? Well, you take your net profit for a month and you divide it by the debt repayment that you're making back to whoever the lender is, right? Most likely it's gonna be the bank and you'll end up with a ratio. So let's take an example, right? I have $1,000 in net profit coming in for this month. My monthly repayment to the bank is 500. So 1,000 divided by the 500 equals two. Now, a lot of people see this ratio and they're like, their eyes glaze over. Some of them are like, yeah, you're speaking essentially a foreign language to me. Whatever that number is, subtract one out of it. Because that essentially will now give us context as how to interpret this ratio. And when you subtract one of it, it'll tell you how many future months you can make and pay back to the lender. So two is really good. Two minus one is one. It means I can pay a future month. I can pay this month, of course. I can pay the next month. And here's the critical phrase out of that. Without tapping into cash reserves, without tapping into this working capital buffer that we see as the preceding point. Now, once again, I mean, what's probably a good ratio, right? Well, a lot of times banks want to see at least 1.5. Two is really healthy. 2.5 is great. Anything above that is pretty much amazing. Okay, It really will depend on your industry. And when you're actually analyzing your cash flow, this is something you should probably be paying attention to. Okay, If you're using QuickBooks for records, it's going to get into a point, hey, let's actually export that into Excel. And then we can use some data modeling to see what's going on with set ratio. I build in that ratio into my pro forma statement. Why? Because if you're needing a loan, you need to see what's going on with it. Now, of course, it'll do a monthly right, but then it'll do an aggregate for the total year. And a lot of times, you know, if you were getting a bank loan, that's what it would pay attention to is the aggregate for that year. Why, you know, there's a little bit of a buffer, perhaps starting up the business and they want to see that you're cranking up operations, generating revenue as can be. That's for the debt service side. What I think interesting is the owner's coverage ratio. I'm sure someone smarter than me came up with that, but it's become my sticking point in this post-COVID, COVID environment, whatever you want to call this current situation. And it follows the same philosophy as the debt service coverage ratio. Instead of the net profit being divided by the debt repayment, well, in essence, I treat it the same where you are a sole proprietor, you're a single member LLC, perhaps you are an escort, but most of the times we're seeing single member LLCs. In that case, you essentially lended yourself money in the beginning to start up, right? You know, if you use self-financing, you gave your LLC money. In essence, you want to pay yourself back. So in this case, instead of the net profit per month being divided by the debt repayment, we're doing the net profit divided by the owner's withdrawal. Now, of course, companies can be taxed multiple ways. You know, you could simply be writing yourself a check from the LLC. You could be taxed differently. You could be taxed as a corporation or actually a corporation, and therefore you have a salary. I don't care which method that is simply replace that number into owner's withdrawal. And it follows the same pattern, right? You know, banks are looking for 1.5. I like to see that you've got an owner's coverage ratio for 1.5. Now, here's something unique about that debt service coverage ratio. When people are doing their cash flow analysis, they'll look at it and they've got that basic formula. Well, that formula actually may be overstated because certain lenders may not want to have the owner's withdrawal included in there. And if it's not, I highly recommend you run the owner's coverage ratio to really with your personal cash flow. Okay. Now, you notice that point down at the bottom is goal C. It's one of the simplest tools you can utilize in Excel, but it can do wonders when you're trying to identify what do I need? Like if we're doing a bank loan and they say, hey, my target's 1.5, we put in the expenses first. I set that ratio to exactly 1.5 by changing cells, and it tells me how much we need in cells in order to hit said ratio. The same philosophy applies here with the owner's coverage. Why do I think it's so important to have the owner's withdrawal included in the debt service coverage ratio and this owner's? Is because ask yourself this simple question. If you're not paying yourself and you're in business, are you really going to be sustainable? The answer is probably not, unless this is just something you're almost doing as a glorified hobby. Otherwise, you need to be thinking about yourself. So many times when we have new businesses come in and they're like, yeah, I'm going to run my cash flow. I'm like, great. I said, what are you going to pay yourself? Well, I'm not going to pay myself for the first year. Hey, I'll get around to year two. I'm like, in all honesty, the buck stops with you. But you should probably be factoring that into 
year one. Because if you're not, there's a chance you may push it off to year three. And then at that point, good luck trying to get the profitability out of it. So I cannot stress that enough. Goal seek, amazing to use, simple tool. If we need more constraints, that's where Solver comes into play, okay? And then of course, you know, we're going into the data analysis tool pack, which another cool feature we're gonna talk about is needed into my second point on the slide. So we're still on the pro forma, right? So this is going now for the existing business, either setting up a new location or just something completely being created from scratch, okay? How do we come up with analyzing what's gonna go on with their cash flow? I live by this rule. You overestimate the expenses, you underestimate the sales, and you start with the expenses first. Why? Because you know that you're going to be spending money. I mean, it's just a hard fact of business. There's no way around it in some shape or form. And why do I overestimate them? Because let's say we were going to perhaps first citizens and saying, you know what? Hey, I'm a new business. I'm analyzing what's going to happen with my cash flow. Well, you don't want to show the greatest picture known to man because there's a good chance it may actually not become a reality. Therefore, in this statement, by making the expenses higher, the sales more conservative, you know, it's less than an ideal picture, but perhaps we are able to show the bank we're able to still make that money. Or perhaps just for you, even if you're not getting a loan, you're going in with no surprises. And that's critical. As a business owner, you don't want surprises. Generally, they don't have a positive connotation, especially in this case. Now, I mentioned doing the expenses first. Why? because it's actually easier to do the data modeling I just spoke about with the goal seek, okay? Because when the goal seek, I literally just focus on the expenses. I set either the debt service coverage ratio or the owner's coverage ratio to our target. And then I say by change sales. Now, if you don't wanna do that method, I actually use a mix of them, right? Because the data modeling shows me, this is empirically what must be produced in order to hit these ratio targets. What about forecasts? If you are an existing business, you have that luxury. So you have two great methods that you can utilize. You have the forecasting function in Excel as an existing business to see what's going on with your products or services. And there's a couple of catches that go along with that. Well, number one, you need to make sure it's set to the right confidence interval. You can technically go from 95 to 99.9% .9 confidence interval. Two, comes around the seasonality. So Excel forecasting, A, it doesn't work on a Mac. So I got some bad news for the Mac owners out there. You're going to need to get a PC for that and make sure it is a new version of Excel. The seasonality is supposed to be detected automatically. But let's say you're an existing business, but you've only been around for one year. You only have one year's worth of data. It's generally good to have several years because the Excel forecasting feature relies on the better or larger the sample size, I should say, the more accurate picture it's going to get. Even then, the automatic seasonality detection eh, can be fickle. Sometimes you got to go in and manually and determine, all right, what were the changes from the high lows to the low to the high, or perhaps just to the baseline months? It's a little bit of an art. Now, the other option you have, if you don't like that, and this is a lot more simplified, it's actually part of the data analysis tool pack that you can install on Excel, and that's the moving average. A lot of businesses will actually run the moving average They'll take the prior data, right? And essentially it'll keep doing that continuous average for the future. And a lot of times they use that for forecasting as well. But the benefits of this coming out of here is let's say you are an existing business and you're gonna set up a new location. You just pull this stuff from QuickBooks. Or if you are brand new and you are purchasing a business as my final statement up here on the screen, you're able to actually pull from the past data. Sometimes understand this is a little more art than science. Yes, you have the quantitative methods and the formulas working, but it still requires a bit of analysis on your part. But these are good fundamentals to make the process a lot easier. Now, talking about QuickBooks, right? So we got existing cash flow. So we're talking about someone that's already in operation, but they really want to do some data modeling. QuickBooks is an amazing tool. You, know, you get Quickens, et cetera. They can produce the reports such as the last point, the aging accounts receivable and aging accounts payable. But they're not that great on doing the data model. That's where you need to bring in Excel. Cool thing about QuickBooks, you can export it to Excel. One of the best things I like to export is the profit and loss detail. I don't like to do the annual cash flow basis. That's one of those things that can be very deceptive, is an annual aggregate. Why? Because it doesn't show those temporary periods where insolvency, aka you're about to go broke, nearly happens. It's why the working capital buffer is really important. But if we export it from QuickBooks to Excel, 
I can dump that in. We can suddenly set up my owner's withdrawal and we can establish the owner's coverage ratio, the debt service coverage ratio, and we can do set modeling. Now, what about more on the micro? Right, because the first point is like, hey, we're buying a business where we just want to make sure we're paying ourselves enough. You know, what do we need to do to increase sales in order to make that a reality? The other two points are more micro than macro. Well, the first is marginal benefits greater than or equal to marginal cost. Okay, this is the third rule of principle of macroeconomics. <laughs> I tell my students all the time. I said, you want to know probably the most important thing or rule is this. This especially applies to things that theoretically could be there be a discretionary cost, and that's critical. Whether or not something is actually earning its return for your business. Okay, we're talking onto the line items of your cash flow analysis. Think about it, let's use one of the best ways, advertising, right? So you do an advertising via social media, perhaps Instagram, you pay $7 a day, you do the max, you do 30 days, it's 210. You wanna look at the analytics. And once again, this isn't necessarily gonna be pulled out of QuickBooks, you actually have to take data in QuickBooks. Then you got to go back to the analytics. Let's say coming out of Instagram and look at it. What's the click-through rate? If you're selling a product or service online, it's probably going to be pretty easy. You can see how many people went through said advertisements and they actually purchased your product online through that. Well, you got to establish a buffer. That is the prerequisite. Not everything happens overnight. But let's say after six months, you've been riding marginal costs for this. You're paying 210 a month. Turns out on average, those ads are only earning you about $100 per month. You got two things, two routes to take. Either one, you either look at the analytics perhaps for actually doing poor content or marketing to the wrong people. But on the flip side, perhaps you're doing everything right as you can, but they're not interested. It's not earning its return on the investment. That's where it's only it's now classified, in my opinion, as discretionary cost, meaning that's actually negatively hurting your cash flow analysis. Therefore, it may actually need to adjust. Now, something a little more simplified is what you can produce out of QuickBooks. It's an amazing tool. The aging accounts receivable and the aging accounts payable. Accounts receivable, it's money that people owe us, but they haven't actually paid up yet. And the inverse accounts payable, that's money we owe them and we have not exactly cleared the balance yet on said bill. One of the things when you're starting with cash flow, I say literally just let's pull up the aging accounts receivable. It'll literally break down into current 30 days beyond that 60 days and God forbid the 90 days plus. We want to see, all right, who do we need to collect money from first out of the customers? Sometimes you may be starting around in that case seeing, all right, eh, 60 days, probably if it's 90, I don't know if you're ever going to collect. Just maybe a sad reality. But maybe we start looking at 30, 60 days. And of course, the current, because we're like, hey, let's get the cash from those people that we know we're going to be able to actually pay. And of course, with accounts payable, do we start to stretch those payments out? If things are getting close to that 90 days, we want to pay them off. Yeah, it's going to hurt the cash flow right now, but it may end up helping us later down the road if we have some substantial cash flow issues, perhaps such as a situation like COVID. Because here's the sad reality. I think it was Visa, correct me if I'm wrong, so don't fully quote me on that. They took a poll before COVID, okay? So it's a couple of years before. And they said 59% of businesses that were surveyed had some form of cash flow problem. I honestly don't want to know what that percentage was in COVID environment, but I imagine it'd be much higher. And this is bringing up the discretionary costs I was talking about. So if you do have these issues, right, hopefully you got that working capital buffer to tie in. Maybe you actually set up a traditional or revolving line of credit to act as that buffer. But even then, you can still go to the line items, whether in QuickBooks, Excel, et cetera, non-essential or you know, what's non-essential in that case. So I love this. I see it in textbooks all the time because yeah, I'm a professor and I, they, I, it drives me nuts. They say advertising is a discretionary cost. And I say, well, we go back to this. If you run the marginal benefit and it's greatly exceeding the marginal cost, that advertising is not discretionary, folks. Please don't cut that. That is what's earning you money. But maybe there is some that's not earning. It's a return on the investment. That would be discretionary. That's one of the first things you do. Maybe we want to actually cut in that case. Well, I've seen also this substantial trading. That is one of the things that COVID had a lot of negative impacts, but it had some very positive ones. It really allowed us to focus on what were essential costs. Now, were you actually needing to send somebody to this conference, paying for the hotel, the travel, the food, et cetera, when they could literally probably do the same thing in Zoom and it's not costing you anything? 
okay, the marginal cost is almost next to nothing. It's a great way right there of even being an indirect discretionary cost. A non-essential maintenance would fall under here. Sadly, I know it's a tricky topic, but donations, a lot of businesses, they really see themselves as a community member, a pillar. They want to help sponsors a nonprofit. You know, in that case, that is really great. But when you come into those hard cash flow problems, if you're on the brink of insolvency, I know it's sometimes it, it becomes a tricky topic. But remember this, you know, if you have to cut something um, in the short term, remember, you got to be around in the long term to make those sponsorships or donations in the future. Deal with the short terms. So that way you actually have a long term. Not always the easiest conversation to have, but it's something, it's a hard decision. A lot of businesses go for the obvious answer. Let's cut the labor. I mean, that's why the PPP was around because they probably knew that businesses was one of the first things we're going to cut. I mean, it's labor is not exactly the cheapest expense, but those people are your assets. Okay. They're the human capital. You invest in them. You want them to develop. So try to make that one of the last elements in terms of a cash flow problem. Why? Because they're earning you money. They're proxies of you. You know, you want to develop them as much as possible. So that's why I always shift that probably towards the one of the last hard cuts you may have to make. Now, I always see this, do you buy used or new? And people say, well, I got cash flow problems, let me just buy used. Sometimes you can get a great deal on used. Other times <laughs> you can end up with a lemon. And that's what we call a sunk cost in business. That is an asset that you purchased and it gets no return on its investment. So you do need to be careful of that. But some simple factors in here, whether you're existing or new, you can go to your QuickBooks, you know, it has the report center. You can set up customized, most of them are standard reports. Do simple things as reviewing the balance sheet, okay? You're really looking to see if anything uncategorized because a lot of times QuickBooks, especially if you're doing it on your own, you're not working, you know, hand in hand with the CPA. Some things might not show up accurate from a reconciliation standpoint. And they'll say, hey, we got an uncategorized asset. Well, it turns out, is that actually misstating what's going on with the cash flow? Figure that out. More importantly, when we're actually looking at a business and they say, hey, I want to know what's going on with my profitability, I'll say, produce the PL, but do this, do a comparative PL with the change, the percent change and the dollar change. It only shows this year, last year, the change in dollars and the change in percent. That's one of the first things we start with. Anytime I see a negative on said report, I bring it in Excel, we need to itemize, go deeper, investigate. You know, correlation does not always mean causation. But as a former professor of mine always said, it is warrants investigation. So we go through there, really see, is this something inevitable? Was it almost a systemic risk that's just part of playing the game? Or was it firm specific, meaning something we screwed up on? Okay. Or was it simply like an error in QuickBooks? Because yeah, it can happen. Okay. So simple tools that you can actually utilize to look at what's going on with the cash flow problem, but it makes it manageable. And this is why I always like to do these issues with clients because a lot of times it feels like it can overwhelm them and we can start simple and then work our way into more of the complex elements. Now, another element that does become a factor here is the inventory, you know, are we overbuying? Well, naturally, please understand, have a strong safety stock if you have inventory. You need to know what is that safety stock level. Think about it like we have the working capital buffer, this is your inventory buffer. But sometimes, yeah, we may be a little superfluous with spending, right? If you're a new business starting off or a new product, you know, you're going to have a negative gross profit probably for that initial period. Why? If you haven't generated any sales off it, at least marginally, and you're spending a lot, you're getting a decent bulk order. Okay. But once you get, you learn the reins, right? And you're understanding here's what's going on with the process. Then you can figure out if you're overbuying or not. One of the first things you do in, in QuickBooks is the inventory valuation statement. All the inventory you have, et cetera. Another great ratio, and I know I forgot to put it up here, is the inventory turnover ratio. One of the oldest in the book, but man, is it great. It can actually tell you how long the inventory is sitting in there. And you can get specific from, you can have the aggregate inventory, right? But you maybe have different product lines. Run the inventory ratio on said specific product line. You know, if it's sitting there too long, it turns out perhaps you're overbuying in this case. It's more, once again, an art than science, but you'll be able to see specifically what's going on with yours. Now, I brought up aging accounts payable a couple of slides back, right? Because they receive, oh, hey, we need to get money from our clients, accounts payable, and that's money we owe people. And you were like, well, 
how long should we stretch this out? I love asking this question, not only to students, but also to our clients. Should you stretch out the payments as long as possible, right? Because in theory, it does help your cash flow. But you got to understand, if you're always waiting to the 11th hour to pay said vendor, they're not exactly going to probably have the best image of you. And it turns out if you miss suddenly a payment, someone will think about it, we're in a disaster like COVID, they may not necessarily be the most uh, accommodating to your situation. It's really good to build up these supplier lines of credit for two reasons. One, so if disaster strikes, they're willing to cut you some slack. But two, it goes back to Jason's point. And this is something I know we probably didn't have time to discuss, and maybe Ben can talk about it. Uh, supplier lines of credit. We talked about business credit, right? And you notice one of the factors I think he indirectly mentioned was the credit obligations of the business. You could actually use this to try to build up to that perfect paydex score. Okay. Now, I've always heard in theory, and I'm no banker, so believe me, I'm not an expert on this in the least, but I've always heard that if you start to get multiple lines of supplier line of credit that reported the major credit agencies, that is going to shoot your way up to, if not, or close to that perfect paydex score. So think about it. It's giving you, you know, they always heard the expression, knock out two birds with one stone. In this case, that's trying what we're trying to do here. Have those strong lines, supplier lines, that way, hey, you know what, cost of goods sold, they're going up pretty much across the board. Hey, people are really seeing that impact. That was actually something we were talking about with our team before this. So having a good relationship with them may help from the cost standpoint, but more importantly too, we're building up some business credit. And I cannot stress this enough, hence why it's my final point on this slide. It is the contingency cash, okay? That six months minimum, that working capital buffer, right? But also too, what about the personal expenses mixed with the business? Do you have a year's worth ready to go if you're gonna start out from scratch? A lot of these tools are available, but they're only as good as there's the research you've done or you as the business owner determining what you need. I mean, like I said, owner's withdrawal. I can't make that decision, how much money you wanna pay yourself objectively. What is your target? Only you can decide that. But once you give that in line, it started to feel pretty good about actually doing some data modeling for you. And thus we've come to the end of the presentation. I know I'll briefly just pull up the Excel file, I'll just show you the simple goal stick. I think I'll do it on a debt service coverage ratio just so you can see what happens. So I'm here, I am part-time through the Aiken Area SBDC. I'd be happy to assist anybody. If you wanna sign up as a client, you can do so with the link, It'll take you like five minutes. And once you're in the system, I'll be able to see. My interns, uh, Kayla and Dave Bosch will probably get you booked in for scheduling. We do initial 30 minute consultation. We go from there based on the needs. So once again, I'm really happy to help all everybody out and we will do our best to assist. So let me actually change over screen sharing for a second. Bear with me. I will pull up the Excel file. It starts off very basic. I've said it for a macro level. Sometimes we end up with like, 30 different tables on different tabs if needed. It really just depends on what the client wants, but to do something simple with tool, we'll bring it up here. So build in, I got this three years for the forecast. It's got amortization to help out with some of the classifications and defining them. You can change whatever you want. But these are the ratios I was talking about, right? So we've got the obvious one profit margin. We got the debt service coverage ratio. And we got the owner service coverage ratio. And that's what I was telling you. Debt service is looking at the net profit and all it's doing is dividing by the debt repayment, what you're making back to the bank. So we can just throw in some numbers here, right? Throw in 250. I'll throw in 250 from the debt repayment. Uh, it's actually linked into the amortization, but for what I'm doing right here, it'll get the point across, right? So we got the net cash added or subtracted. We're coming out with 500. Notice we got a negative debt service coverage ratio. Probably want to fix that. Well, I was telling you about this simple tool, right? Data, what if analysis, goal seek. So in this case, I'm going to say, hey, the bank told us we got to have a target ratio of 1.5 and I got to go change the cells. So let me do that. I mean, yes, this is really simple because we literally have, what, two expense categories. You're like, well, I can do that math in my head. It's a little more complex when we actually start getting all the data in place. But now it's set to 1.5, right? Now that's just with the debt service coverage ratio. And let's say we were doing this from a startup perspective or purchasing a new location, right? In this scenario, the data modeling just shows us what has to happen in order to make that true. 
a lot of times what I like doing is a trifold mix. I'll have you do some forecasting through Excel or doing a moving average on historical data. I'll have that match with what's showing up here, auto generate at 625. And then sometimes I'll actually have somebody do baseline, which is just talking to industry uh, experts or people that are similar that don't see you as a threat. We establish a conservative baseline. We know the high seasons and low seasons. We identify the exact percentages. And I'm looking for a convergence of all three forms of data. If I'm seeing said convergence, feeling pretty good as a consultant helping you out for the bank or perhaps just for yourself. Otherwise, yeah, we may not look into it. I mean, you can do more detailed tools and this gets into net present value. You know, we could discount the future cash flows. Theoretically, we could run an internal rate of return. But a lot of times we're trying to keep it a little more manageable for the typical business, right? That was debt service coverage ratio. What about the owner's coverage service ratio, right? In this scenario, the owner's withdrawal is not stated. This is where I tell somebody, I'm like, well, how much money do you want to pay yourself? And I love seeing just like the blank stare. It's like, well, oh, man, I really don't want to pay myself 50,000. It doesn't feel right. What I'll actually do, and I've done this with fine, I have ledgers built as well. So if you're not operating QuickBooks, I've got a cool ledger similar to this, where whatever you put in will produce a working time cash flow analysis, similar to what QuickBooks will do. But also, too, I've built a personal ledger that does a working cash flow analysis for all your personal expenses. Because for those single member LLCs, they're like, what do I need to pay myself? I'm like, well, let's go look at your personal expenses. So honestly, a lot of people have not actually run a cash flow analysis on the personal. Like, oh, that's not affiliated with the business. <laughs> actually, it is, because that's really going to determine what you need from the owner's withdrawal. I mean, if you're doing this on your own, let's say, shoot, you lost your job, you got to take your skill set and actually make money. We need to know what's going on with your personal cash flow, because that's going to impact it. So a lot of times we'll reference it in, but maybe, you know, it is like 50,000, right? We'll take it, you know, divided by 12, so we get a monthly basis. And we end up, you know, with the $4,166.67, okay? We're not having a good owner's coverage ratio. Similar thing, shoot, let's go run a goal stick on it. In this case, I want to set this to two. I want to go change it, change the sales. Congratulations. Now I got to make over 8,500 in revenue per month in order to make this possible. Now, even if you don't use these ratios, right? Look at this, we got an amazing debt service coverage ratio though, 33. Okay, FYI, I probably don't take that at the bank. That'll probably scare them. Um, back to the point though, the net cash added or subtracted. Now, this is another thing that sometimes comes up with cash flow, especially with single member LLCs. They don't exactly analyze their data. They'll go through and they'll say, Hey, I'm like, what are you paying yourself? And you're like, oh, I just pay myself whatever. I'm like, are you actually looking at the PL for the month? Because let's throw in that scenario, right? We got eight thousand, you know, three hundred and thirty-three dollars. You always want this net cash added to be positive. Sometimes it'll be negative. And if that happens for one month, it's not a bad problem. But as a pattern, it is. Because sometimes you're like, well, I'm making a net profit. I'm paying back the bank. All things good. I'm paying myself. Well, it turns out, if that thing is negative, what that really means for context, your bank account balance for your company is diminishing. And that's not a good pattern to have reoccurring. So in that case, I may actually look through them before they actually pay themselves and if they don't on a monthly basis, say, well, let's just briefly look at this ledger, the real-time cash flow analysis. What do you got? And if it turns out, let's say it is 8,300, we definitely don't want to be paying ourselves $9,000 because look at it, we're ended up with a negative. I mean, stress that, it can happen for one month. That's not the end of the story, but as a pattern, it certainly is problematic to say the least, okay? Simple tools. Okay. It's not requiring you to even set up solver because honestly, when we want to set up a model using solver, you got to get the constraints first. That's critical. And then you have several models. I think you got GRG, you got Simplex, et cetera. Sometimes you can end up with very fickle answers, especially like the Simplex uh, data modeling engine. You mess that up, you will end up with a very strange like this will help you out. But if you're ever interested, that forecasting I mentioned is coming into here. I mean, this is just basic. I've literally pulled some random data and it's not going to produce anything of what we need. But we're able to break down in terms of what do we need from a uh, bar chart in this case. I can set the forecasting percentage. I can tell how long we want to go out. And that seasonality I mentioned came in there. Now, if we wanted to go in some like moving averages, I think it's installed on this version. Yeah, in terms of it's right here under the data analysis tool pack. So that would be another good method in order to actually forecast ongoing sales. 
And that's something I really recommend to existing small business owners. Identify what's going on with your real-time owner's coverage ratio. You know, if you have any debt, what's going on with your real-time DSCRs? Keep a list of the scheduled assets, things you might have to liquidate if worse comes to worse. But one thing we will do from a data modeling standpoint as well is we'll look at this net cash added and I'll make sure we'll take an average, right? Take an average across the year and then times it by six. And then we're saying like, do we have that working capital buffer in place? Because we'll set these objectives. Once again, goal seek. Okay. And I, I know this is a lot to take in. But these are the consultations that I absolutely love doing. And my interns even tell me that they're like, yeah, we get the most out of that. We take a single operator, right? Somebody building up and expanding their business. We dump all this in. We do the modeling on the cash flow analysis. And sometimes it's not having a direction that can hurt a business under the worst cash flow. Once you get objectives in place, it shows you, okay, like this is the amount of sales we got to generate. We can do a weighted analysis of the price, weighted analysis of the cost of goods sold. We can identify a monthly break even. It then gives you monthly objectives. It gives you weekly objectives. Theoretically, you want a daily objective. You have all those capabilities for you. So that's my spiel on cash flow analysis. Um, you know, I guess we'll get around to the questions, considering we've come to the end of the presentation. Hi, Brent. This is Carolyn. Great job. Um, it was wonderful because Jason was able to answer quite a few of those in the chat box while you were um, okay, great. presenting. We did have a few questions about, can you send the spreadsheet? And I shared with everyone that the individuals who respond to the post-event survey will receive the slides from the presentation. Also, we can send out the forecast spreadsheets. Yeah. as well as a link to this recorded webinar. Great. And those will probably be sent out next Wednesday, which I believe is the 18th. There have also been some um, questions about how can they find other recorded events. Britt, oh, yeah. can you share that, please? Yeah, let me do that real quick. That is definitely a benefit, because if you weren't able to be present, this will be your best friend. So here we are in Firefox. All I ended up doing was going to our state website, scsbdc.com. And you'll notice this will pop up. It's got a cool promo video. But what we're looking for is the training events. So we click that. And look, not only does it tell us the upcoming and current events that you can register for, and of course, sign up for Quest Counseling, it gives you the past recordings. So in this case, you see Introduction to Ghost Kitchens. You can download that, watch it anytime, go back and forth. If there's something you missed and no different, this cash flow and credit will be part of that. So it's a great feature. So I'm going to shoot some of my students use it all the time. So we really hope you take advantage of it. And the direct link, this sign up request counseling, if you are in the Aiken area, I would suggest using the link I provided in my slide because it'll actually automatically put you in the Aiken center. This one, you will have to manually select the center that you want. But I know we got people across the state, so that's great. Make sure so, you get the right center. On that and case. Brent, can you show where you would go to locations and you can select your center by using the map? Oh, yes. Awesome. Yeah, so here we are across the various counties of South Carolina. We got Aiken. And, you know, it brings you to the Aiken team. You know, that's myself. And it's got the contact. And, of course, it would do the same thing. Like if we click for Buford, Mr. Martin Goodman would show up. So you can get directly in contact with So with that said, any other questions? I'm looking through the chat. I think I think we got them, Carolyn. I think that you I did. I do have one question. Yes. Hi. So this was very, very helpful information. Thank you for taking the time. Certainly. I am in the very beginning stages, very brand new yep. business owner. And I'm launching in a couple of weeks, but this part of it scares the mess out of me. The numbers, it's a foreign language, accounting, right. numbers, finance. So I, it's like, it's so much that yeah. I have to play it again, pause to yeah. kind of absorb it. So what do you suggest that I can get it? Because I definitely want a private consult, a one-on-one -on -one because I, sure. I, I need, you know, I need this information. So I wanted to see what you would suggest in my case. 
honestly, if, if this is giving you some cause for concern, I'd say I'd be happy to have a consultation with you. Because honestly, these mm -hmm. take about an hour. Some go for two hours if we're really okay. going to get in depth. So, I mean, that's, I, unfortunately, there's really no macro level answer outside of the, some of the subtle tools I talked about. But yeah, if mm -hmm. you want it really customized, please, um, that's, that's kind of the bread and butter of my services with SBDC. So I'd be happy to do that. And Alita, okay. I have advice. your information where you registered, so I can forward um, your contact information and everything to Brent, so okay. he can reach out to you. Absolutely. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Great. My pleasure. Is there anyone else that has any questions for us today? Well, everyone, I would like to thank Jason very much. Jason, Indeed. thank you for going first, but you were able to stay on the call with us. So thank you. And Brent, as always, excellent job. We can certainly tell that Brent is um, a lecturer and instructor at um, Aiken University of South Carolina campus. He is a great gentleman and very, very helpful in instructing new business owners and existing business owners with this type of um, task. So if there are no more questions, we're going to conclude the event. And please remember to respond to the post-event survey. And we, in turn, will send you the slides from the presentation, the spreadsheets from the presentation, as well as a link to the recording. So thank you very much, everyone. And we certainly appreciate your interest and your attendance. Thank you. Thank you again.